Meine Damen und Herren, bitte erheben Sie sich für den Richter. Nach sorgfältiger Prüfung der vorgelegten Beweise und der Zeugenaussage, die heute stattgefunden haben, befinde ich die Angeklagten Hope und Ethan Sebastian für unschuldig im Namen des Gesetzes. Das hat es noch nie gegeben. Eltern landen wegen Schwänzen vor Gericht. Das ältere Paar mit jamaikanischen Wurzeln ist das Glattfelden nicht an einen älteren Abend von der Schule. Der wäre obligatorisch gewesen, darum hat es einen Bus gegeben. Die Eltern haben das nicht akzeptiert. Heute ist es am Bezirksgericht Bülach zum Prozess gekommen. So sehen die Sieger aus nach einem jahrelangen Prozess. Die Hope und der Ethan Sebastian haben nichts Unrechts gemacht. It's a victorious smile. Cool. Did not establish enough evidence. Wegen einem älteren Abend vor Gericht. Bis daher hat sich der Streit mit den Schulglattfeldern massiv aufgeschaukelt. Er eskaliert 2014. Die Eltern erscheinen nicht am Infoanlass zum Klassenlager von ihrem Sohn, obwohl der laut der Schule obligatorisch ist. Wegen dem gibt es einen Bus von 200 Franken, den die Eltern nicht akzeptieren wollen. The Sebastians arrived in Switzerland for the second time in 2012 with the intention of permanently residing. It was my second time moving to Switzerland. My parents and I had lived in Zurich before and I remember attending preschool in Zurich. So now that I was a bit older, living in Switzerland again meant that I would be attending primary school, something that I was really looking forward to. Although I was born in Britain, after honeymooning in Zurich, my husband and I loved it so much that we decided to stay. I just love Zurich. The city is everything that I desire in a natural city. Its voice, its buzz, its style and its class make it special to me. Zurich is my adopted home. So after leaving, we realized that it was not just a city that we loved, but that Zurich was the place meant for us to be. The requirements to settle in this picturesque part of Switzerland were familiar to us, and immediately we started to do what we needed to do. My wife, being a certified chef, well, she found a job in a restaurant, and I, well, after an initial rejection, I was hired as a part of a chemical cleanup crew. All we needed after that was an apartment and a school for our son. As the Sebastians graced Zurich once again with their presence, they felt at home. It was a place of familiar sounds, familiar scent, and familiar streets with unknown adventures ahead. Ja, also wir empfehlen sicher jedem Fall zuerst mal das Gespräch zu suchen. Dann ähm, kann man allenfalls äh, Sanktionen ergreifen, wenn das, das zwingend notwendig ist. Aber ähm, also Bussen aussprechen, das sicherlich nur, wenn es nicht anders geht. Und das machen die auch nicht schon alles auch. Well, I think parents' evenings are very important, because school and parents have to work together to um, make the best for the students. To be transparent, to know the goals and to have the same goals. Find a good solution after school. My name is Andrea. I am the mother of three children. They are here in the Schweiz in school. I have now learned that there is a bus when a child does not visit an evening school. And I find that absolutely absurd. It can always be a situation that a child does not visit an evening school. Und ich habe die Erfahrung gemacht, ich war an vielen älteren Abend, in der Unterstufe, in der Mittelstufe und in der Oberstufe. Und hat die Erfahrung gemacht, vielfach wird auch einfach nur Blabla erzählt am älteren Abend. Also nichts, was wo, wo wirklich essentiell ist für das Kind. Und von dem her finde ich es ja, nicht in Ordnung, wenn man Eltern büßt. Wie gesagt, es kann immer etwas dazwischen kommen. Es kann ein Unfall sein, es kann ein Auto sein, das nicht startet. Oder sonst ein Abfall. 
Es ist kein Grund, um irgendjemandem einen Bus aufzubrauen, nur wegen dem. Man kann ja reden mit den Leuten. Auch der Richter, der in dem, in dem Fall zuständig war, hat das ganz klar ähm, annulliert. Weil er einfach gefunden hat, es ist absolut daneben und ich finde, er hat das Richtige gemacht. Zu was will man die Eltern noch alles zwingen? Sie sollen Kind von A nach B fahren, sie sollen alles machen. Auf die andere Seite, wenn es um die Hausaufgaben geht, dann heisst es, ja, äh, das ist eine Sache zwischen Kind und Lehrer. Also jetzt müsst ihr euch entscheiden. Entweder Lehrer, der mit den Eltern zusammen schafft, oder eben, ja, das geht euch Eltern nicht an. Punkt. Wenn es uns Eltern nichts angeht, dann geht uns auch die Bus nicht an. Das ist meine Meinung zu dem ganzen Fall. Also muss einiges passiert sein, bis das nur schon mal zu uns kommt. Und dann haben sie auch bei uns wieder die Möglichkeit, sich einzubringen. Wir könnten auch ein Verfahren einstellen, wenn wir jetzt finden, die Schulpflege überreagiert. Das könnte ja auch der Fall sein. Also es ist wirklich ein mehrstufiges Verfahren. Um, Parent-Teachers-Meetings, I don't think they're very important. Um, they tell you what you want to hear. You actually know your child better than any teacher. Um, you know what they're good at, you know what they're bad at. Um, so it doesn't matter what your t the teacher has to tell you about their child, you know them better than anybody. The PTA meetings are usually for parents that want to be, well, they're better off, basically. It's not for the people that are on the ground level, so to speak. So I don't think, no. I'll say take me to prison or take me to court because I don't care, they're stupid. Like, people have jobs, their children's attending school, they're not missing school. It's not as if they're absent from school. Um, everyone's got a work life, they've got a work life balance. The children are going to school. I just think it's a total waste of time. I think everyone needs challenging at times. Um, like I said, school boards are not always right. Parents are not always right. I mean, it's just the world that we live in at the end of the day, but you know your child better than anybody. The world's financial downward spiral of 2007 was still affecting the Sebastians, who traded their West Midlands residence in the UK for a guest house in Seabach, near the city of Zurich. I was born in Jamaica. My wife was born in England. Um, my wife's parents are Jamaicans. So that makes my wife a Jamaican British or British Jamaican, so to speak. Um, we lived in England for a while and um, we decided to move from England in 2007. We decided to move from England and we went to Jamaica to live. We live in Jamaica approximately a year and a half and then we decided that we're going to move back to Europe. I knew that Jamaica wasn't for us anymore, so we decided to um, basically spin the globe and pick a country. We happened to fall upon Switzerland and we kind of did our research on Switzerland and we thought, okay, sounds like a, a good country um, to live in. Um, we also heard that um, the Swiss way of life, Switzerland, was on the top of the um, best places to live in the world. So, Switzerland it was. Um, we, we didn't know anyone here, we didn't have any friends here, any ties here. We just um, chose Switzerland um, to come to make it our start, our new start. We don't have any ties. We originated our residence here solely on ourselves. And after relentlessly searching all sides of the city, the Sebastians found an apartment in Zwedelin, a small Swiss village on the edge of Stadt Zurich with a population of less than 200 people. Zwedelin consisted of mainly farms, a train station, and a few homes. The community of Zweidlin was very small. Um, we kind of like um, did some research on Zweidlin and I think there was about 200 people who lived in Zweidlin. Glattfelden was the neighbouring town and in fact the Gemeinde for Zweidlin was in Glattfelden. 
Um, I'm not sure of the number of people that live in Gladfelden, but I'm sure it was like a thousand, maybe more than that. Now it's more developed. Um, we live only about two minutes walk from the the train station in Zweidlin. Um, Zweidlin is in the canton of Zurich, but it's actually at the last point in Zurich because um, technically um, it's about three minutes ride on my bike to the German side. Yeah, so it's a small community where we lived and everybody seemed to know everybody else. If anyone new came into the area, then people knew that, okay, this person is new. Where do they come from? Um, and stuff like that. When you speak of Zweidlin to anyone that's um, familiar with Zurich or familiar with um, the neighborhood, um, they automatically think farmers and farmlands. Filled with livestock and vegetation, Zweidlin is often perfumed with insect repellent mixed with animal manure, tuned by a faint roar of the Rhine River and throttles of tractors' engines. Zweidlin is where people expect to find what we call the real Swiss people. Um, kind of like country people, not city people, people who tend to just stay um, in the, the undeveloped part of Switzerland. Um, it's a very quiet neighborhood, um, but as you can imagine, because it is quite a distance from the city of Zurich where um, it's more integrated and more happening is going on. Um, the mentality of the people in Zweidlin are slightly a bit backdated in my opinion. Zweidlin falls under the main community of Bulak, but because it is so small, Zweidlin is umbrellaed by the slightly larger village of Gladfelden. Together, these two villages have a small post office, two small schools, and a mini market. Um, Zweiden is a very boring place, it's not very wow, anything about it, so um, for young people I wouldn't recommend it. The Sebastians were desperate, so any apartment found would do. But the Sebastians were clearly out of their depths when they moved to the neighborhood. People of color were never before seen in this part of Switzerland, and as it appeared, were never expected to be seen living there. Ourself being black um, was more of a strange, and they had their own conception of us. Um, their conception, from what I've seen, their conception, um, uh, stereotype blacks as expected to be illiterate. Um, that's, that's the only thing I, I notice, um, they think considering that you are not only a foreigner, but you're black, um, you don't quite know anything about anything. Um, there was a few people who were friendly in, in Zweidlin. Um, we met another family. Um, they were from Greece, and we seemed to communicate um, with them on a, on a good level. Um, my son was... Um, the same age as their son. As the Sebastians tried to settle in their newfound apartment, mission number one was to enroll their then 11-year-old son Jay in school. Jay was accepted in Shaw E. Colesley, one of the two local schools. They chose a school for our son and that was in Gladfeld, the neighboring town. So that was the biggest school. There was one in Zweidlin, but it was, it was like 30 students there, so it was too small for him. And plus he needed um, to learn the language, so he needed a bigger school. But although it was local, it was farthest away from Zweidlin. An hour if Jay should walk, and 30 minutes if he traveled by bicycle. Um, believe it or not, Jay was 12 years old, but he, he had never ridden a bike before, so... Um, that was a task as well that we had to deal with. So I remember that we went to a school and um, they said they had the space and uh, 
Um, it was an okay meeting. The first time we went to the school, we met with um, teachers. They, they appeared very friendly and very welcoming. And um, our concern, you know, was more as if anybody there spoke English because, you know, we are an English speaking family. And we were hoping that um, his transition from English to German learning would be a better train. Uh, uh, not so difficult, not just full-on German without any room for translation of what he's actually hearing or reading or seeing. But everybody appeared friendly. The school told us there were teachers from America, I believe from Canada as well, I can't quite remember. But they were English-speaking teachers and they appeared to be very excited and overwhelmed about um, accepting Jay. When we first got to the school, we met with the principal and she seemed very nice. Um, she spoke a little bit of English to us, um, as I can remember. Um, we met his um, class teacher and she was very nice. She was very interested in English as well, talking to us in English. She was young and she was very enthusiastic about her job. And as we got there, we kind of like liked it, so okay, this could be good for him. It was a big school and the children there in his particular class, there was um, two or three um, Auslanders um, or foreign children in his class. So we were, you know, surprised at that because Gladfelden and Zweidling is predominantly white or Swiss people, I would say. And um, so, as we first got there, we thought, okay, this seems okay, this seems good, so let's see how it goes. I remember this first day, you know, I decided to take him because we didn't quite know the distance, how far it was. And I remember, even though it was widely, now that I've known the neighborhood, I know the neighborhood, it's such an easy find, but I remember this first day in school, we actually got lost because, um, I walked along a little river that existed um, in the neighborhood and ended up like way behind the school instead of in front of the school. So the first day it was actually late for school and um, but in the end we got there and everybody was happy to see him apparently. The Sebastians were on a roll. Apartment, check. Jobs, check. School for Jay, check. But this feeling of satisfaction was short-lived as complaints about Jay began to roll in from the school every week. Communication with us and the teachers or us in the school was usually done through this book. The Jay has this booklet or the teacher has the booklet, but Jay is the middle person. If the teacher wants us to do anything, to sign a document or communicate anything with us, she would write it in this book and then we would acknowledge that we seen it or or we write a reply we sign it or that's how we communicate it through this book they call the contact f um i think it just means a communication book as the months went by um we started to notice little things from the school um little problems that kept building up so um in particular, there was one incident about how Jay had to get to school. And the first issue that I can recall was um, they said um, we shouldn't take him to school. Um, he should find a way. He should come to the school independently by himself. They couldn't take a bus. A local bus existed, but its schedule would not work for Jay's required arrival time at school. He didn't have a bike at the time pressured us to buy a bike. If you walked from our house to Gladfelden School, um, it would take him about maybe 50 minutes walk. Um, on a bike, it took him about 25 to 30 minutes each way. There was a woman that lived near us and her job was to drop the kindergarten kids, which was near Jay's school, to school. And what she'll do, they'll make an exception for us for one term and that woman could take Jay back and forth to school um, throughout his lunch break and so on and so forth. And it worked. It worked for the first term. The second term, they said it can't be done no more. 
don't know why, um, it just couldn't be done anymore. They don't want to do it for us anymore. So we said, okay, fine. They suggest that Jay must get a bike and he must ride. So we said, okay, we'll find a way. You know, Jay's never rode a bike before, but um, we'll find a way. So what we did, we bought a bike and over the summer all the day, that summer we didn't go anywhere. I used the whole summer to teach him to ride a bike and thumbs up to my boy. He actually, <laughs> he actually learned to ride a bike within that summer. Uh, we bought a bike, then he needed a helmet. Of course, that is law in Switzerland. So we bought him a helmet. Then they said the bike was too small, that he needs a, a better or a bigger bike. Don't ask me why the size of the bike was relevant. It's just... After we got the helmet, they were saying he needed a chain for his bike, and then we got a chain for his bike. They start saying again, gotta get him a, a, a larger bike. Okay, we told him straight up that it's not within our financial means to buy another bike. Not at the moment. One of the teachers suggested that um, she knows somebody who's selling a bike, so we bought that out of the teacher. So now Jay had a bike, had a lock, had a helmet, he had everything that was initially an issue. And when we thought that, okay, everything is fine, the problem now was lunchtime because it took him 25 to 30 minutes to ride home and to ride back to school. There was very little time for him to eat lunch. So we decided to give him a packed lunch and eat somewhere around the school. That also was a problem. Their suggestion was we should pay for lunch at the school. We told them we don't have the financial means to pay for lunch. They say only paying student can actually use the school canteen. So Jay was not allowed to eat in the school canteen. I said, okay, fine. He was also not allowed to eat on the school grounds. So we decided at the time, okay, here's the deal. What you could do is eat around the corner on a park bench. So what I'll do, considering that I was working from home, I would take my lunch time the same time as you and I will come down and we will sit together on the park bench and we will eat lunch. Well that didn't work for long because after a while I got a job that didn't allow me to work from home and Jay was on his lonesome again. Um, the teacher saw him and says that's not, that's not right. So it was a build up of a lot of um, things that we thought were petty things. Um, what led us up to the actual court case? On May 20th, 2014, a meeting was scheduled for the Sebastians to meet with their son's class teacher and a few other school officials. The Sebastians naively thought that this meeting was going to be similar to all other meetings they have attended before. But this meeting was different for it would change the lives of the Sebastians and the Swiss legal records forever. The Sebastians were frustrated by the constant complaints and demands from the school. And as the meeting began, Ethan Sebastian was the first to express his frustration. I remember saying to the, the, the attendees, which was the principal, um, I believe two of Jay's class teacher and the president for the school, um, Marco Dindo. He was a, he was in attendance at this meeting, and uh, at this time, you know, as a father, as you can imagine, I was um, I was fuming. Um, I was not very happy with the unnecessary um, irritants that the school was putting on to Jay. Ethan told the board that he was fed up with the school's lack of assistance, the constant complaints and unreasonable demands, before threatening them that if another complaint about his son arose, he would withdraw his son from the school 
and report the whole matter to the relevant department in Zurich. This wasn't the first PTA meeting. I've had class meeting with his teacher. Um, I think her name was Frau Tempest. I've, I've had meeting with Frau Tempest and her assistant teacher. Um, my wife and I, we both had meetings with um, Frau Tempest and her assistant teacher. I believe on two occasions before this actual meeting. So at this actual meeting was the first time I was going to meet the president of the Gladfelden School, Marco Dindo. He was a short guy, if I remember right, he was no more than four feet, I would say eight, something like that. Real cocky attitude, real, um, he was one of those guys that have this, um, this devilish smirk, uh, this cockiness, like um, I'm above you, I'm above the world um, kind of thing. Also in attendance to that meeting was the um, principal of the school, Frau Wagner, and Jay's second teacher, Frau Tempest. There was also another teacher there that taught um, Jay um, German, I think. Uh, she was English, or she spoke English. Um, I think she was from Canada. I ask, is it okay if I speak in English? because I know you, you guys understand English and I want to be clear in what I'm saying and if I try to speak German, it's going to be all over the place, messy. Believe it or not, you know, um, Herbie the foreigner and she lives in, in Gladfell and she was the first one to kind of like made a, a semi-objection like, what do you want? Do you want us to speak English throughout this, this whole meeting? So I says, hey, 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 easy. I saw it as an opportunity for me to declare my feelings. I'm only saying I have something to say and I would like to say it in English. Is that okay? So they murmured amongst each other for a second and then they agreed that I said that I can speak in English. My husband um, made a point about that, you know, um, we felt like we were being bullied and that we won't tolerate that as parents. There has to be um, a respectful line um, between us and the, t the teachers and um, also there has to be respect for um, our child as well um, he's coming from another country so you know um, we felt like there was no help from the school I didn't feel very good that I didn't feel like the teachers were actually trying to help you get through the problems that you wanted to get through or we're really helping you, but we all have different experiences. So I kind of like got up, stood up, you know, greet them, and then I said, you know, I'm the father, I'm the head of this family, and um, we migrated here from the UK. No one asked us to move to Switzerland. We came here on our own accord, you know, and we understand that this is a German-speaking country, and we respect that it's a German-speaking country. And we are not saying we're here to change anything about that. If we can deal with it being a German-speaking country, we can always go back to where we're from. But if we should ever have to go back to where we're from, we would rather to do so on our own accord. In England or other countries that we've lived in before, we've never allowed anyone to walk over us or treat us less of, any, less of a human being. So we will not tolerate it in Switzerland and me being the head of this family will not allow teachers or anyone to walk over my son or treat him any different. Well, as you can imagine, that statement didn't leave um, smiling faces. It created attention and um, it seemed to have offended Marco Dindo, the president of the school board in Gladfelden, more than anybody else. His offense was more like, who do you think you are? How dare you talk to me like that? You are nothing but a measly parent, and I am King Kong, Marco Dindo. So, even though those words weren't uttered by Mr. Dindo, I came to that I came to this conclusion that that's, that was his state of mind later on.
Um, that PTA meeting was, it was really a telling off to be, to be honest because there was things that they say that we didn't sign, there was things that they said that we didn't receive and there was no communication with us, between us and the school and that um, everything from there on had to be within um, school laws or Swiss laws. The class teacher, Frau Tempest, had one day hung up the phone in the middle of a conversation. She was asking, where is Jay? I told her, Jay's on his way. She was saying, um, he's always late. And I don't think Jay was ever late more than two to five minutes at that school. There is not a whole lot of lit street <laughs> in Zwadlin and Gladfelden. In the middle of explaining my situation, the teacher hung up the phone in my ears. It was just like click in my ears. Try to call her back, she didn't pick up. Sent her a message, she didn't reply. Then I sent her a letter and I told her she was very rude and she was very unprofessional and um, it was not accepted by me nor tolerated by me. So that was also an issue that I had to bring up in, the, in this meeting. So I guess we became the school number one enemy where parents were concerned because we were odd parents. We were parents who stood up for our son. We were parents who shot back at these, at these teachers who thought they were like, well, the rules only apply to us and they can do whatever they want to do. You can call it hypocrisy or you could call it evil. I don't know what to brand it, but at the end of this meeting, everyone smiled, everyone shook hands, and everyone says, well, we'll keep doing things the way we're doing it. If we don't understand anything, make a phone call, communicate by text messages, and the contact there and everything. So we were under the impression that everything was fine, everything was peachy. So we shook hands and um, apologized for all the misunderstanding that we've previously um, experienced. And we went on with our life and we exited and we went on feeling good with ourselves. Marco Dendo, the president of the school board, apparently was offended by Ethan's threat and his reaction to such stance was far from the smile and handshake which he offered at the meeting's end on May 20th, 2014. A letter that was um, supposedly being distributed to parents through the children from school. Um, it was for a PTA meeting and that was for a mandatory PTA meeting. Now, we never received this letter and um, that was the problem for, for the teachers. They says that they sent out a letter with Jay, our son. Says we never received this letter, we never got this letter. Can you send another letter? They didn't send another letter and they kept pressuring us for the date um, for us to um, fill in um, the slip. We have got the contact tab and we see where she's saying we need to sign the form and return it, but we don't know which form she's talking about because we have not received the form. This teacher that we're supposed to have been working together as parents and teachers, she sent the form after the date of the parent-teacher's evening. She stuck it in Jay's uh, contact theft and then she wrote something along the line of this is the form, the date is already passed. And she wrote it in red ink. I remember that very clearly. I probably still have it here in my office. Within a few weeks following May 20th, the Sebastians were surprised to receive a fine by mail. Mr. Dindo had issued a penalty of 200 francs to the Sebastians. Reason? Failure to appear at a mandatory parents' meeting. I send it back. I put return to sender and I ask something along the line of, are you people crazy or what? Um, what are you talking about? We did not agree to come to a meeting. We did not sign a form. We didn't even see a form. So I'm very sorry. We're not going to pay this. The refusal to pay gave the school's president the opportunity to prove his powers to the Sebastians, and that's exactly what he did. Marco Dendo, the president for Gladfelden School, reported the matter to the Bulock police station as an infringement of Swiss law, 
and the Sebastians were interrogated and charged on September 9th, 2014 at 8 a.m. It was a revenge technique. After we gave our statements as to what happened on our side, he said, okay, um, that's his job done, and his job is to forward this information to a different department in Bulak. I think it's like the town's governor or something like that. Or the, 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 it's not the real court. It's like, um, I guess in English, it would be more of a small court or a justice of the peace um, person who will um, weigh up the odds and weigh up all the two sides and then come to uh, a conclusion. And that's what the police officer did. Penalty order number ST.2014.8390 slash MAM slash BK and penalty order number ST.2014.8390 slash MAM slash BK were assigned to Hope and Ethan Sebastian respectfully as criminals and on September 30th, 2014, the Sebastians were deemed guilty of breaking the law and ordered to pay 450 Swiss francs each. Each interview took about maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, there was a little bit of a sticky situation because um, my husband had the evidence on him and he knocked on the door to come back into the room and the judge uh, wouldn't let him back into the room and kind of like pushed him away. He was utterly rude. I didn't even explain to this guy what is it that I'm knocking for? He, he didn't even give me a chance. This guy slammed the door in my face. So my husband called the police. The police asked what was going on. I explained, asked if there was any real injury. I said no. And they said, okay, we'll um, call us back if things get out of hand. So it was a bit of an ugly scene at the beginning um, of the meeting, the first meeting with this judge. Um, in the room, um, he heard our case and he had also um, questions for us about the PTA meeting that we had before with Marco Dindo and the teachers and why we didn't go to the, the PTA meeting at the school. Um, after my wife um, left, I went in. But as you can imagine, there's already a tension because this guy, is, I can feel his bias already. Because if you don't know me and you're slamming the door on my feet and slamming the door in my face like that, then I see where this is going. We gave our evidence. My expectation was, you know, innocent before proven guilty, so to speak. A few months later, maybe four months later, um, there was a second um, meeting with the judge. March 17, 2015 was the date scheduled to question representatives of the school. This included Principal Francisca Bergener, class teacher Regula Tempest, and the man behind the fine himself, school president Marco Dendo. It wasn't really for us, it was for Frau Bergner and Marco Dindo, Dindo for, to hear their side of their story and you know what they did in accordance to the rules of the school and Switzerland. It was the second time that I was meeting Marco Dindo and um, the, the school principal was there. I believe her name, if I remember correctly, was Frau Bergner. She was there, but the school teacher was not there. Frau Tempest was not there. We were able to be in the room as both people Frau Bergner and Marco Dindo talked. Um, we weren't allowed to say anything in reference or defense of what they were saying. Uh, we just had to hear what they were saying. 
Frau Bergner made a statement about how many times she's met us and our awareness of the situation. And then it was Marco Dindo's turn to tell the, his side. <laughs> um, needless for me to say, but, uh, he was speaking in German. I understood what he was saying, most of it. And needless for me to say that he stood there with us present in that room and just lied. And at the end of this meeting, would you believe, um, Frau Bergner reached out to me, shook my hand, shook my wife's hand, and um, we, we returned and shook her hand. And would you believe that Marco Dindo tried to shake my hand? I thought, this guy is really full of himself. After he sat there and told all that lie right in front of my face, he actually wanted to shake my hand. Obviously, I looked at him like, are you crazy? And I just walked away. I didn't shake his hand because I realized the type of person I was dealing with. I realized that with this character, what you see is not what you get. He, he wasn't a straightforward education rep representative. He wasn't someone that tell you how he feels or tell you what he believes is right or wrong. He was very sneaky, like a very snake type guy who um, would smile and shake your hand and then go behind your back and um, pull something like this. That was that for, for, for that segment of the situation. What I understood by law and what was explained to me as well by this advocate um, at the uh, at their meeting was that what will happen now is he will weigh up both testimonies that was um, made and given to him and after some time we will get his ruling and his reason for ruling as a ground. That is legal procedure, um, legal procedure 101, I knew that. But what happened was nothing like that. On April 26, 2016, the Sebastians were ordered by the Stat Halterant and Bulock to pay either a total of 2,280 Swiss francs, 1,140 each, or face time in prison. So after about a year, we received a letter from Bulak Court um, stating that we had to pay a fine of 1,400 each. Um, that was for court costs, uh, judge costs, and, and, and things like that. And um, it had no judgment to it, so we didn't know um, if we were right or if the teachers were wrong. There was nothing to say that okay, because of this meeting, we believe that you were wrong, or the teachers were wrong, or the school was wrong, or the school president was wrong. So we sent. We drafted a letter, my husband drafted a letter, and he sent um, this summons back to the courts. I sent it back, immediately I sent it back, and I says to him, you have to give us your finding and the reason why you found, why you found us guilty, and then we should pay this bill. This guy was so angry that he sent us a second bill. And I believe this time the bill was, I can't quite remember, I've got the paperwork to, to support it. But I believe at this time the bill was double. I was supposed to pay 2,000 and my wife was supposed to pay 2,000. So at this time, we, we had a combination of a bill of like four or 5,000 francs we were supposed to pay. But instead of a, um, an explanation or grounds or the findings why we should pay this money. This letter did not come with an explanation or ground. This letter came with a threat. If we do not pay these fines, then we would have to spend, I think for me it was two nights in jail and for my husband it was three nights in jail, I believe. So my husband again got on the case, got on his computer and wrote to Bulak courts and saying that you can't give us a fine without coming to a judgment. So we appeal that and we we need to know what are we paying for. We kind of like said, you know, 
we're going to take it to a higher court because he's assuming that we are wrong. He's assuming Swiss teachers and the president of the, the school was right and we were wrong. We immigrants coming to this country were wrong. And he assumed all that and he thought, you know what? They're not so intelligent. That's what it seemed to me anyway. They're not so in intelligent. This is Switzerland. It's not their country, so <laughs> let's tell them that they are wrong. And my husband, he studied law. He studied Swiss law. And, um, you know, he, he says to me, it's wrong. They can't do that. They can't pass a judgment and give us a fine and threaten us for two days of jail without any evidence, without any solid evidence and just hearing what we say and what the teachers say. So he drafted another letter and he sent that back um, to Bula Courts. From the time of the first bill of 200 um, Swiss francs were issued to the time we got to court, it was more than two years. We finally had a court date to go to the, the high courts in Bulak for September the 5th, 2016. And on September 5th, 2016 at 2 p.m., the Sebastian stood before Honorable Judge Buller in the District Court of Bulak and pled their case on the infringement of Swiss Law Article 56, Section 1 and 3, Article 57, VSG, Article 64, VSV, and Article 76, Section 1, VSG. On the day, it was, um, it was an afternoon appointment. It was, if I remember rightly, about 2 p.m. And um, we were ready. We got to the court on time, maybe about 20 minutes before our court time. And um, as we walked up to the, the court steps, um, this guy kind of like leapt out in front of us. I mean, we did see cameras and people outside the court and we thought, what's going on here? So my husband joked and he said, um, are you here for me? Um, and the guy who jumped out on us actually said, yes, we are were from Zurich News in Zurich, Switzerland and um, we heard about this case. It's a unique case and it's never happened in Switzerland before. A parent has never challenged um, a school or school board ever and that it, it piqued their interest. So they were there to film us. We went to court. We explained to the judge the reason for us not paying. We explained the correspondences. Um, we explained why we kept returning the bills. And the judge kind of explained his job to oversee the whole procedure and everything. It was time for the verdict. And um, it was a tense moment. Our day in court took about three, four hours. And after weighing up all the laws, all the um, rights and wrongs and what relied on our particular case. We were so happy to hear when the judge says we were not guilty of um, this charge, this um, school charge. And we breathed a sigh of relief. I was holding my breath and then when he said that um, we were no fines to be charged to us or anything. The judge found that the case held no, no real substance. It shouldn't have even gotten to his desk to begin with, you know. So we were pretty pleased about that. We were pretty happy about that. And um, we were even happier because we didn't realize that um, the case would become national news. Um, and to be victorious and it be national news, we were pretty proud of ourselves. We were ecstatic, we thought. Thank the judge and we thought, Man, this is history. This is this is really history. After four hours of questioning, examining, cross-examining, and legal reviewing, the judge found the Sebastians innocent of all pending charges and dismissal of the cases followed. News reporters who were allowed in the courtroom 
hastily exited to sound the alarm. And immediately, the story roared through the airwaves of Switzerland and created a buzz on social media as the case involving the Sebastians etched its way into the history books of the Swiss legal system forever. It was a glorious moment. We were happy, we were happy when it was over and we were just pleased that it, we, we could put it behind us. We're still happy today. I thought it was very cool that my parents is in the newspaper. A sign of normalcy resumes, where they can return to their day-to-day -day activities. Ethan, back at his desk, writing and promoting his book. Hope, back to her paints and brushes. And Jay, happily partaking in school, learning with contention and smiles. And as the Sebastians continue to live in Switzerland, their family remains strong, armored with readiness to fight and overcome all unperceived adversities that may arise. Never forgetting that despite being foreigners in Switzerland, they are family wherever they roam. Jay, the son, Ethan, and Hope. I am thankful for my parents who have given me the opportunity to see a lot of this world. I have lived in several countries and have attended several different schools too. My grandparents and my dad were born in Jamaica, so despite me being born in England, it should not be a surprise that I even went to school in Jamaica. I now live in Switzerland again, and I like it here. It is different from England where I was born. Living in Switzerland, I have to learn a new language and a new culture. The whole experience is an adventure. But always having my parents around is a priceless security. As I grow, I watch my parents deal with day-to-day -day situations, and by watching them, I am also inspired. And being grateful to my parents, my dream is to be educated, learn as much as possible in school, and hopefully one day, it will pay off to make my parents proud.